Come on out, everybody. So, I'm Eric Hesseldahl from Recode, and we're going to talk about securing the enterprise in a lot of different ways. All the big companies. So, I'll let all the panelists, let's just start. This guy you know, he was just here, but introduce yourself again for those on the stream. Okay, uh, I'm Ben Steckler, the CEO of, of um, excuse me, Avast Software. Avast is the uh, producer of the most popular um, endpoint security products in the world, uh, mostly for the consumer market. For the mobile, though, we're also heavily into the enterprise. Thank you. Um, Raj Samani, uh, Chief, Technology of, Chief Technical Officer for Intel Security, formerly known as McAfee. I also work as a Special Advisor to the European Cybercrime Center, and we are the most popular endpoint security company in the world. <laughs> okay, these guys, these guys are going to have We have a fun. disagreement here. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be a fun panel. It, it depends on who you ask and how you measure it. Let's just, we'll, we'll stipulate that. Hello, good morning, Stephen Rymel. Um, from Airbus Defense and Space Cybersecurity. Um, wearing two hats, I think, today, both as a, a service provider internally for Airbus and uh, also providing services externally on the market. Okay. Many, many years um, engaged in cybersecurity activities with different organizations, also with the British government um, in the past, but now uh, here based in Germany. Okay. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Puttikofer. I'm the CTO and Director of Innovation of Airlock. Airlock is a part of the Swiss company Ergon Informatik AG, and we provide uh, security solutions for protecting web applications and uh, other HTTP-based uh, interfaces. Okay, so I don't like to use a lot of buzzwords, things like advanced persistent threat and endpoints and things like that. I, like, I basically rail against that. But I want to start our discussion at a really high level. And um, what I think is still new to me, and I still struggle to get my head around it, is that the days of corporate IT security when you flipped on your, your firewall and gave everybody in a lecture about a strong password and hope for the best are pretty much over. Uh, the, the, the nature of what we're protecting is a lot more complex and there's a lot more to it and there's a lot more value to the information and to the relationships. So I thought we would just run down the left to right um, what, how you kind of define and think about the scale of things that you're protecting for your clients, what they're coming to, what you see kind of on the horizon. Let's just kind of start with sort of a big view, and then we'll kind of drill down into some of the particulars. So Vince, why don't you start? OK. Uh, the old turn on the firewall. I remember I, I used to work for what was at the time the largest endpoint security company in the world, who was Symantec. And I remember years ago when they first provisioned me with a PC. Um, a laptop, of course, and they didn't give me the lecture on the firewall, but they very nicely had on the desktop this file called Read Me First that very conveniently had all the passwords um, in it uh, that I needed. Um, very, very helpful. I really appreciated it. Um, and, you know, but that's how kind of security was, even for a security company, say, 15 years ago. Uh, rather porous. And I think now what's happening is, is, is people realize that the, uh, you know, that the challenge really is uh, the data. Uh, and uh, even, uh, even on the consumer side or on the uh, corporate side, you know, it's, it's the value of the data that you have in your network and how do you have to protect that data. And people have realized that it's, it's far more beyond endpoint, you know, firewalls, antivirus, intrusion detection, that it's now a very, very complicated thing, that data is very valuable, and data is what the bad guys are after, be it from businesses or from consumers. Uh -huh. The challenge you have on the consumer side is, is that consumers don't put value on their data. They put value on the device. So if they buy a device for 
they don't want to pay $60 to protect that. That's one-fifth of the price of the device. It doesn't make any economic sense for them. And businesses have a little bit of that issue also, but I think they're much more cognizant to the value of the data. Yep. So um, I actually want to change the discussion slightly because I think each and every single one of us here in this room and listening to this stream are probably in the most exciting time of our lives because what we're witnessing is remarkable innovation, remarkable opportunity. You know, actually back to your point earlier, um, was anybody surprised that WhatsApp were acquired for $19 billion? Anybody? I right? Was. Yeah, you were surprised. But think about it. They had 40, every single one of those accounts was worth $42 a user. And if you look at Instagram, for example, Instagram were acquired at $30 a user. And if you look at YouTube, they're acquired at $20 a user. So the actual value of personal data is actually increasing. And you know, back to your point, the perceived value of personal data is decreasing. So for me, I think you know, if we look at the world around us, we have this remarkable opportunity to you know, free up personal data. We have these new business models. For example, you know, utilities will have more data than Facebook could ever dream of you know, through smart metering, for example. So for me, you know, the world ahead is, is really exciting. And I think, you know, for us as, and, and I don't even call us as security professionals, because we're not security companies. We're the organizations that help build trust into digital systems. And you're going to need that when you're driving 70 mile an hour. Actually, you're in Germany. You can drive whatever speed you want. But when you're driving 100 miles an hour down the road with your family in there, you need to know that you can trust the digital systems that have your family in there. You don't want to have the same issue that you've had in, you know, in the Ukraine, for example, whereby attacks have resulted in outages of power. Okay. I must say, probably in this panel, I'm the old timer here, and I can even go back to the days of uh, paper cards and uh, mm -hmm. the small glass, glass room in the corner of the building where the computer center was based. I can even remember a day when uh, they were suffering a regular outage. Every single day, a particular time, the machine would go down until they discovered that it was actually the cleaner in the corridor was pulling the plug out, plugging the vacuum cleaner in, and then uh, when she'd finished plugging the original plug back in. And that was, those are the days of uh, the security concerns that the organization had there. Anybody could just walk in and unplug <laughs> the machine. Great. I think now, just to take another angle, I think one of the biggest concerns that have developed for organizations that need to protect themselves is the change in the way that everybody works. You know, we're, we're no longer looking at an organization that's a castle surrounded by the metaphorical uh, stone wall. Um, the data is out there. The people are out there with the mobile devices. We have data in the cloud. We are more and more blending personal and working life on those devices. The data is getting mixed. And you can no longer think in terms of protecting that wall around the castle. You really have to concentrate on um, thinking about the data that you want to protect, um, the assets in your organization that need the most close scrutiny. Um, you have to assume that with all of those threats and that attack surface out there, that people will certainly get in. Uh, the question is then, how robust are your um, activities to make sure that you control the, the damage, that you can make sure that the, that the really crown jewels inside your organization are, th are thoroughly protected? Do, do, you, um, do you also then assume in your kind of philosophy there. Is there sort of a stated assumption that, somebody, that an attacker is going to get in to, add to your system at some level and therefore you have to manage? I, I think there's a state of mind. Um, it's not always certain that that's the case at any given point in time, but I think you have to work from the basis that your systems are or will be compromised. And that is a, that is a fact that will happen. Um, we certainly within Airbus, uh, Airbus Defense and Space, we're constantly mm. testing our defenses, measuring our response. And we can see exactly what happens under certain circumstances. And, and, and it's moving us more to that mold of um, not just deploying the prevention, but making sure that the, uh, the whole structure of the, of the organization, where we keep the critical things, uh, and the response uh -huh. is there uh, behind that. I see. OK. Mark? Yeah. I. I partially agree with what you said at the beginning, or I want to emphasize this, um, that I see that digitalizing business, especially small businesses, is just at the very beginning. It's going to be more and more, uh, it's not only 
putting your data, making your data of your company accessible to your customers or to your employees outside your business. It's more and more combining services, combining cloud services for other, from other um, uh, companies together with personal data. And I uh, strongly believe that besides all these security measures that we are also going to discuss, like client security, like threat intelligence, and so on, that small, even small and medium businesses, and these are the vast majority of businesses in, in Germany and Switzerland and possibly whole Europe, um, they're not going to be able to employ all these security measures and put all this information together because it will, be, it will not be feasible for them. Then I think the, 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 the important thing is to do is to find what are the places that you have to protect first to, to safeguarding your business. And uh, there I strongly believe that it's by really protecting your technical interfaces you have, like your uh, web services, your REST services, and so on, on the application level, not on firewalls and so on. We have been done this for 20 or 30 years now. We know how it's doing. But on the next level, we have to, to protect your data and your services. And I know from, from uh, helping uh, businesses for the last 16 years doing so, there's still a lot to do in this, in this area, which is, sounds a bit profane, but there's still a lot to do. Because these are the simplest, the lowest level, or ha lowest hanging fruits for attack attackers to gain access to your data, to steal your data, or to uh, do denial of service attacks, and so on. This, this brings me to a very interesting point, because we talk a lot about protecting this and protecting that, protecting this mm -hmm. you know, valuable trove of data here or that valuable trove of data there. Um, but it also brings to mind that there's probably some very basic steps nowadays that people who run companies, who run you know, the IT, without having to contact any of you at this point, I, I think there's sort of like hygiene practices that people could probably turn on and start to use for free that you could probably make suggestions. Um, and so let's, Raj, let's start with you and then Vince and, and then we'll work out. So um, what do you think is the most common entry for criminals into any organization? What is the most common tool used by criminals today? Email. And email. That'd be my guess. Yeah, it's as simple as that. You know, if you look at actually all of the major hacks that you've seen, they all, start with, they all started with email. Even things like um, you know, the billion dollar theft, uh, Carbonac, which was a tax against Eastern European banks, was, uh, was, was through email. And just this week, we had the Bangladeshi bank who were compromised for $80 million. And the only reason they were spotted was because the criminals spelt a word wrong. And Deutsche Bank, the, the routing bank, actually managed to detect that. So, so I do think you're right. You know, there are cyber hygiene in terms of you know, getting people to understand not clicking onto emails, or you know, simple things like you know, making sure that you do have up-to-date security. You know, the most common virus today is still Conflicker, which was, we've known for years now, over nearly a decade now. So you know, doing the simple things first raises the bar. And, and, and that you know, won't eliminate it, but it will reduce a lot of the I guess what you said was the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. How many of us on this stage, how many of us in this room, let's do this, how many in this room use two-factor authentication on your email systems? I see two people, three. How many of you, four, how many of you don't know what two-factor authentication is? I'm curious. And don't be bashful. There's one. Okay, two. Okay. So you, <laughs> would you all agree that two-factor authentication is, is a good a piece of hygiene. Well, let me ask another question very quickly. Well, go ahead. How many of you, you run antivirus? How many of you update your antivirus at least once a day? Twice a day? The issue is, is that it's, it's, a, it's a game of cat and mouse. Right. You know, we just took down a botnet with the European Cybercrime Center called B-Bone, and that was a form of malware that was updating itself 35 times a day. Wow. So, we are in this game of cat and mouse. We will innovate, they will innovate, but if we don't do the simple things right, then they're going to get in without, ever, without so, doing So what's your best practice for updating? At least once a day? Yes, at least. As a user, Vince, <laughs> do you agree? Well, no, not at all, because I think we're making things too complicated for users. 
why the heck should a user have to know that their antivirus has been updated once a day, 10 times a day, 50 times a day? That should be done by the product. It should be tr completely transparent to the user. As techies, we tend to forget that 95% of our users have nowhere near the knowledge that we have. And we have to build systems for the general population, not for the techies. Like, to me, I think most everyone here was lying. Unless you're all techies, very few people should know what two-factor authentication is. And two-factor uh. authentication is not going to fix your, uh, your, your issues with being fished or scammed for, uh, through emails. It's just going to fix the issue of can someone else easily get into your email yeah. uh, or not. But you know, I, I think the, you know, the number one thing, I mean, it, it, it's nice to say that the number one weakness for security is the user. It's very true. Mm -hmm. But very close behind that is security companies and IT guys making, designing things for themselves and making it too complex for the normal user to really do. I, I would, Even I would my IT guys, we just rolled out a new HR system and a new um, 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 finance system. They rolled out different usernames and password schemes uh, for them. And you know, when you don't take care of simple things like that, that causes people to now write down their usernames and passwords because they can't remember, okay, this system, I can use a question mark, but I can't use a bang sign, or I gotta have three numbers in this one. This one over here, I can only have two numbers. We make things too complicated. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, different passcode schemes drive me absolutely insane. <sighs> and things are too complicated, but um, so. That, that much I, I would see, I, I would agree with. So, Steve, yeah. want to? I think just picking up on the points uh, that Vince made about uh, people are, if you like, the biggest risk is human, human nature, human behavior. I think um, reaching out to the organizations here, um, actually picking up also a point that we discussed beforehand, uh, organizations are only um, a combination of many, many people, nothing more, nothing less. And the way the people behave, the way they understand the threats, and the way they respond in their normal daily life is a, is a critical aspect of the security of the organization. I think um, there's, if you just want to pick up some really, really basic understanding of where you stand as an organization, I do a little bit of advertising for the uh, Allianz for Cybersicherheit and the BSI. They've got a really great 13-point checklist takes maximum one day for an organization to fill in, actually just go through and consider all of the points that stand in there. Of course, we have user, you have emails, you have password, you've got a bunch of things there. Very, very good material if you just want to make a start and understand where you are uh, in terms of your security status. Yep. Mark? Um, I would like to, to add something to the point uh, you said before uh, about client security, virus scanners, and so on. I think this is, uh, agree with you, this is a very uh, important step to making it harder for people or computers getting infected, sending emails to uh, companies, compromising their business and so on. But I think it's, it's not really, the client is something that the, the service providers, the companies providing services to the net. And I think there is still, as I said before, there's a lot, a lot of going, business going to go more digital, providing more data, providing services to uh, customers, to other companies. I think the client, protecting the client is very important in raising the bar, but it's something you can really not control. We, I cannot trust the clients, even if, if there is probably uh, scanners on it, if, if there is client security or not. It's just one piece in the whole puzzle. I think for, for the companies, the, the, the first thing that they should do, and I, uh, um, say, uh, I'm sure that many companies have, done, have not done that right yet, is protecting their data and especially protecting their services. And that should be as, in, in part, uh, as independent as possible from the client. Of course, we cannot go all the way and say we don't trust any client and uh, it's okay, but... <laughs> From my point of view, uh, this is the more important point because it's the point that we can control as businesses. Okay. All right, let's kick, it up, let's kick things up a notch here. So the theme of this entire conference has been digital transformation. And yesterday I had a panel up here where we sort of debated what that meant. But one of the phrases that comes quickly along with digital transformation 
digital transformation, see, I can't even say it, it's awkward, um, is uh, IoT. And so we're not just talking anymore about protecting the notebooks on the desktops and the servers in the, in the data center. We're talking about protecting the sensor that is connected to the network that's grabbing data from the air conditioning unit or, or something in the manufacturing system. And so all this stuff that was never connected to the internet before, never connected to the corporate network before, is there. And it just feels to me like, and I think you'll agree, but I, I want you to try and address sort of the implications of all this. Those are all entry points. Those feel like entry points that an attacker could exploit. We've seen the target case was probably the most widely known example where an air conditioning company got a hold of, got, got into a network by way of the air conditioning system. Uh, and then compromise the entire corporate network. So let's talk about what the IoT stuff means for you. Raj, let, let's start with you. So ag again, I'm going to try to be positive about this. For me, IoT represents an opportunity to do things differently. Um, and, and I think, you know, here we have the opportunity to integrate trust into the new way of working. You know, I mean, a great example was, um, actually a good friend of mine runs a, a actually is responsible for security for an oil and gas organization. And what they were able to do is they built the world's first digital oil field. You know, they have full remote management of offshore drilling from their central location. And the net result was they re increased oil production from 400,000 barrels to a million barrels a day. That is the opportunity that IoT brings. And actually getting it right can create that term of digital disruption. In other words, doing things differently using technology. So for me, you know, I think integrating trust into these systems and finding a new way of working provides us, actually, it's what we need to do as a society because, you know, population growth is going up, you know, fossil fuels are depleting. We need to do this. Right. So you get, you get that. And yet, we still, they still present a security, a complication to the security well, it's a different risk. Yeah. So a good example was if we look in healthcare, you know, we have electronic health records. Now, electronic health records means that potentially anybody with a computer connection can actually gain access to this medical data. Now, is that more of a risk? Well, it's a different type of risk because previously, anybody that's been to a hospital will see these people walking around with these carts of medical data in paper and with no audit capability in any way, shape or form. Now with digital data, we can actually have things like audit logs, access control, two-factor authentication, I apologize. Um, we can start to have, so it's a different type of risk, but I think it's a risk that we have to move towards if we want to grow as a society. Mm -hmm. Vince, what do you think? Well, I think um, Internet of Things, you said you're going to stay away from these buzzwords, so it's nice I know, I know, to come I'm... back to it. That, um, I think it's kind of uh, two different things. You've got the Internet of Things kind of at the enterprise level, uh, which is what we're talking about here. But then you've got kind of enterprise, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Internet of Things that's really perceived as consumers and SMBs. And consumers and SMBs are very similar. So, you know, here you're talking about all the devices, your HVAC devices, maybe your smart Samsung refrigerator, your Fitbits, et cetera. And I think Internet of Things in that case, it's actually pretty damn simple. Bec and I, I know that's not what people want to hear, but it's because most of those devices are friggin' stupid. Uh, they don't connect to the internet. They connect to a router somewhere. They connect to an access point. So they themselves uh, you know, are not additional weaknesses or entry points. The weakness and entry point fundamentally for an SMB or a consumer in the Internet of Things is the router that has the connection to the internet. Now, unfortunately, as much as we may think that people should design for security, in high volume devices, they design for cheap. Mm. Um, sure. And cheap doesn't go with security. So the most popular home router in the US costs $20 from Amazon, and it's riddled with known vulnerabilities. The most expensive home router in the US are the Apple routers with no known vulnerabilities. But $300 versus $20, what do people buy? Here in Germany, the most popular router, what's it called? Pardon? Fritzbox. 
lots of vulnerabilities, yeah. cheap. Um, so you take in all these fairly dumb devices, you're connecting them to a very porous, cheaply built, you know, insecure router, and that's where your weakness is. And if you're gonna protect the internet of things and SMB and consumer, you gotta focus on how the heck do you improve the security in the router, or if you can't, how do you layer it on top? I disagree. And that's I, I, fine. I, but because I think, you know, these dumb devices, whilst they may not have a great deal of processing power, they are still collecting information about you, me, my family. I mean, in Germany, for example, you had these smart meters which were able to determine what TV shows people were watching. That's right. That, so, that's a really great example. So, so I think, you know, we talk about security and we kind of, you know, fail to con look at the concern around privacy. These, these dumb devices are collecting information knowing when I'm using the hot tub or the fact that I'm watching Star Wars when I shouldn't. And, you know, we're going to live in this society whereby, which is back to your point, in which our personal data is being sold, traded, commoditized by companies, by criminals all across the world. And we need to start doing more to help get people to be aware about these considerations, I believe. Yeah. I think a lot of those devices actually, I don't know, there was a study I read about a year or so ago where a lot of them turned out they're running Linux because it's cheap, to your point. But because they're running Linux, which is free, you can open up a terminal session on them and you know get sure. administrative privileges, yeah. and they probably have default passwords for admin privileges. Right, but the, I think the key thing is you know ignoring the the privacy side, which I, I I really agree with. But the privacy side goes far beyond the Internet of Things. Like probably for example, Google knows more about you than probably anyone else in the world, um, and it, it's not because they're in the Internet of Things, because they and Facebook just collect a massive amount of yes. data about you in order to better serve up advertising. Information that we willingly give them, too. Yeah, and, and, we, and we give it to them more or less voluntarily. But most of the Internet of Things devices right now don't directly connect to the Internet. Uh, you know, they're connecting through another point. So if you want to centrally protect everything, they're, you got to protect that around. point. Now, in the future, Future, they're going to get more sophisticated. They're going to start directly connecting, and then is when you have the explosion of security threats. Right, that's interesting. Steve, what do you think about this? Yeah, I certainly can't disagree with what's been said about the consumer devices. I think maybe going back to the enterprise again, I would just consider, as an organisation, it's already been expressed, this massive opportunity through digitalization, huge opportunities for efficiency. But as an organisation, Think about where old meets new. Um, you have situations where you might be suddenly exposing an environment to another, a new threat surface, um, which didn't exist before, and where, especially when it's very old, there's plenty of organizations still running as Windows XP. There's plenty of um, critical infrastructures out there which have to live for 40 years before they've got another investment coming along, and you can't switch them off, you can't shut them down you start to expose those to some of the um, um, risks or issues associated with Internet of Things, then you, then you have to make sure that they're part of your consideration when you're building on these kind of um, efficiencies that you can, right. you can take from the Internet of Things. Mark, what do you think of IoT? Um, especially when thinking about Internet of Things, uh, I imagine that in, in 10 or 20 years, uh, millions or billions of things are connected to the Internet. And I, I uh, agree with you, Vincent, that, that the, probably the, one of the major problems is that it has to be cheap, and companies uh, manufacturing things, Internet of Things, or connect, things connected to the Internet, they um, focus on, on functionality. They want to have a little more functionality than the other vendor and so on. And they don't really do it right in terms of security. Not all of them, but many of them think of all the car hacking stuff that is now uh, published or discussed about. I think now would be the, the opportunity for our industry, for the security industry, to do it right with Internet of Things. Uh, things connected to the internet regarding security because we have not done this right uh, 20 years ago or 10 years ago regarding uh, web services, web servers and so on. We learned a lot how to do it, what to do, but in, in, in uh, all these things I read in the press and on, on these forums and so on, um, I think people don't really have learned a lot of how, 
important security is. Probably they don't really see how important security will be when all the things are uh, connected to each other. You mentioned the car uh, with the family in future. It's, uh, um, you mentioned the health business and so on. There's lots of, of uh, challenges we have to address and I think this is the chance of the security uh, business. Uh, we have to convince people in the company doing these things, and we have to convince also the consumers not to accept uh, just devices that are cheap and that do, uh, do the, what they're supposed to do, but also, also have an eye on uh, how do they deal with privacy issues, how do they deal with identification, do the devices know whom are they talking mm. to, do they know the users, do they only expose their services to who is supposed to use it, and so on. I think yeah. if I may come back on that point, there's a challenge also with regard to people's understanding of, of data protection. I think we buy these devices and sometimes they're even designed to collect your data. We willingly buy those devices, we willingly use them. And yet when you come to protecting in the enterprise, there's sometimes real concerns when the security officer comes to you and says, okay, we need to do these particular measures. It's not going to make life as comfortable as it was before. Uh, and we may be collecting some data about you which actually you've probably already given away on one of your hand devices. Uh, but then there's a concern, and, uh, and especially in Germany, I think the, the workers' councils rightly have a, a concern to make sure that the individual is protected. But I, I find an inconsistency uh, in the approach there somehow. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about IoT. I'm gonna bring another buzzword in. <laughs> I know I hate to do it, but <laughs> cloud. Four years ago, when I first really started covering, well, actually, it was more like six years ago now, but um, when I first really started closely covering corporate IT, um, there was a lot of anxiety among the decision makers, the CIOs, the CTOs and such, whether or not they were going to use the cloud, whether it was running an application on AWS or bringing in a SaaS application like Salesforce or you know, Workday or whatever and making it mission critical in such a way that you know, they would be entrusting a third party with you know, potentially critical data. And it's a really sensitive topic. It actually has some important legal ramifications here in Germany particularly, but I think widely in Europe as well. And I, I'm just curious what that means to the security environment, the way you think about it. I mean, now that anxiety is disappearing. Companies are embracing cloud solutions, whether it's infrastructure or applications. How does that change the security makeup the way you think of it, Raj? So there is no such thing as cloud. I mean, it's a made-up term. Ah. Um, there are companies providing services over the internet, and they market that as cloud. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. That's your job to find out and do your due diligence as you are legally required to find out which ones are good and which ones aren't. I mean, with that in mind, actually, um, we've just done a study and we asked 1,200 senior people across the world about when is 80% of your IT going to be hosted in this cloud? And they said within 16 months. Wow, 80%. 80%, yeah, which is remarkable. And, and now you're seeing this term cloud being used for water treatment applications or for critical infrastructure environments. For you as businesses, the most important thing you can do is to start to do your due diligence to make sure that the company that you are using, who are marketing themselves as cloud, are doing a good job of protecting your customer data because you can outsource the work, but you cannot outsource the risk. That's interesting. So by due diligence, let's get a little specific here. Yeah. The, the cloud, <coughs> so-called cloud companies, would have had audits or some other things done against their systems, and, and they have to, they have an economic motivation to want to be constantly upgrading and iterating their systems as they go. That's their motivation. So, as a consumer, how do you, what's the best practice in terms of checking on them? So, you have no transparency in cloud, you know. Because if you want to know how secure your data center is downstairs and whether they use armed guards, you can walk downstairs. If you go to the big data center within the cloud, you, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I should probably disclose, I, I'm a chief innovation officer for the Cloud Security Alliance and wrote, wrote a book on cloud security. Um, 
So there are tools that can be used. For example, you know, there's the Star Registry, which is a free portal that you can use to determine which cloud providers have actually done what certifications, security certifications. But I think where we start to move towards in, in the future is you know, real-time monitoring or situational awareness, whereby you, know, you can actually query whether this cloud provider has deployed antivirus or whether this cloud provider has done these certain things. You know, getting transparency in, an, in, a, in, a, in a world that has no transparency is, the, is really where we need to move towards. And there are tons of free tools out there where you can start to query that and actually start to query the, the provider. Vincent, do you believe in the cloud? Do I believe in the cloud? I, I, I used to, because I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy, even older than these guys, I think. And uh, to me, the cloud takes me back to the days of uh, IBM 370 with 3270 terminals and TSO. Um, <laughs> That's old school. That's old. Um, but uh, I mean, essentially, just to, you know, as it says here, it's just uh, your outsource providing of a service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, consumers are basically doing it based on a, um, a level of trust that they have uh, with the company. They trust Apple. They trust Google. They trust Facebook. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of these, and you know, they more or less trust Dropbox. They just probably find it too complicated and thus never use it. Um, so you got a whole bunch of things on the consumer side. On the corporate side, I think it's like uh, anything else. It's a little bit like the Wild West right now. You got to do your due diligence, but eventually, they're going to, um, you know, uh, have a shakeout, and you're going to have the big guys. You're going to have Oracle. You're going to have Amazon. You're going to have SAP. You're probably going to have IBM, maybe HP. And it's, it's going to end up being just like the old days when you outsource stuff to IBM GS, and now you're going to outsource it to Amazon, and you're going to have an SLA, and you're going to make sure they're secure, et cetera. And the, the issue is how do you get from the current state through the Wild West to that stable state? What do you think? I think for the... <clears throat> Is very true that everything's been said. For the European companies, there's another consideration. It is just a data center somewhere. Um, there's a, always the issue of European uh, data uh, protection and regulations, different laws in different countries about whether data is accessible or not uh, in the event of legal cases. Uh, you need to very, very carefully think what type of data specialist you've got, uh, data about your employees, where that's going to end up. Think very, very carefully about the quality of your provider, but also where they're exactly based, where, de where that data is backed up, where it, could finally, where it could finally end. Is it inside the European uh, legislation zone or not? Um, that could be something that you really need to consider. Um. Cloud, the word cloud is used in, in many different ways, like uh, data cloud, um, persistence cloud, uh, service cloud, whatever. It's, it's a very wide term. So in, in, uh, in my view, the most important thing of the cloud is just is combining services. It's combining services for, for individuals, for, for the consumers, and especially also for the, for the businesses, for the companies. And I clearly see the trend to companies going in towards a combined cloud solutions with part of their services are, are uh, driven by their own on-premises or somewhere else that doesn't really matter, and uh, combining it with other services and from, from other companies, from other countries. Um, and for the businesses, I think I agree with you, Raj, it's, it's, it's their it's their job, the business's job, to make sure that the, the services, the cloud services they're combining together to, to, to make their own service, that they are trustworthy, that they do their things right. I don't really think that uh, we're near a place, where, near a, um, a point where we have uh, meaningful certifications for this. Probably we can, um, we can encourage people to only accept such services, but I personally think that's a bit farther away, but companies really have to, they cannot not outsource the, the responsibility or the risks uh, when they provide data or services from other cloud services within their services. So I think it's actually, it's, for them, it's all about really knowing who is, who is the user, who is the client, um, what data is the client accessing, what, can, what data can be combined and what not. But for the, for the consumer, 
especially when, the, when you think of the cloud in, in some 10 years, when the cloud is much more also about devices, all the cars, all the fridges, all the toasters, whatever, uh, put together. I don't think that the consumer can really know or, or feel or control what cloud services are used and what not. And I would like the consumer to, to, to give him back this information to, to let him know how, uh, who is going to keep what data of him. But that's really a challenge that I, I think there's no solution for this yet. Unless m maybe you have some uh, <laughs> ideas how this could be. Because yeah, there was a book. I, I wrote yeah. <laughs> so, so actually, yeah. Was what, was, what, what was the conclusion of your book? Let's get <laughs> well, page one said um, there are a ton of tools and a ton, and, and I don't want to talk products, but there's a ton of tools and industry forums and working groups and best practices. I mean, Anisa, I, I've published a number of papers with them. Uh, Anisa is the European Network Information Security Agency around using cloud computing. And I think we, here, here's the thing that I implore every single person here is get engaged within the industry. You know, work with the CSA, it's a voluntary organization. You know, engage with Anisa. Start to look at best ways that we as an industry can help provide the world that we want, that I want my kids to grow up into. I don't want them to be sitting in a car which hasn't had security and privacy built in from the start. And I want them to understand the value of personal data because companies are making money from my data, so why shouldn't I get some benefit? Right. So there is a, there's, there's a whole slew of things that I think we can do. Okay. We have about two minutes left, and I would like to see some questions from the audience. So this is your chance to ask your pressing security questions of this distinguished panel of experts. We have no questions. There we have one right there. So there are several representatives of security companies. I was just wondering, um, especially in light of IoT, how many of you are working together with, the, let's say, developers and developer frameworks to actually build more secure systems, um, especially for the IoT world, from the ground up, implement, for instance, memory safety, you know, forget about unsafe memory languages, uh, build 2FA into frameworks so that developers actually start building software. And I'm wondering if there isn't any tension here uh, in between security applied retroactively to, to software and not, not uh, building it from the ground up. Yeah. yeah. Take it. Good. Go yeah. Um, we have uh, actually uh, tried to do that with a, a number of device manufacturers and have basically received uh, zero interest or zero desire for doing so. Once again, it's because what I brought up earlier, uh, the cost issue. They're trying to strive for the cheapest functional product possible and taking the additional effort of building security in. They don't see that right now. It gives them a sales advantage. Raj, maybe you've got a different. Yeah, so, so actually IoT is like, you know, like that wide. And so it's difficult for me to say we've done X for IoT because every, you know, wearables, consumables, energy, the whole thing changes. But you know, we're, we're working with, with, with energy manufacturers or sorry, automation contractors within the energy space, both nuclear, substation, oil and gas, developing new meters. We're working with the automotive industry. We've got an automotive security review board. I mean. We have uh, 101 different use cases that I can bore you with, which I've run out of time. So. <laughs> we are pretty much Which is an time. enterprise versus I'm speaking on consumer. Yeah. 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 That's OK. Did you want to handle that question at all? Yeah, okay, uh, very much. I think uh, certainly what we're doing, I can't talk. Again, we haven't got time to talk about specifics, but we have our own range of technologies, but also working with um, all the range of different technologies, technologies available on the market, including, of course, uh, Intel and others, um, focused on the integration, the self-learning, the uh, understanding between the different tools and technologies to try to maximize the uh, protection that organizations can get so that the, the, the tools don't stand on their own. And we have a virtuous feedback loop um, between the detection and the future prevention. Mark? Yo, I'm you uh, to get in on this one, then we got to go. <laughs> I'm in the situation that the, my employer, Ergon, uh, they also uh, are in this business of programming and producing um, things, connected things, uh, embedded devices, especially for uh, building automation. 
And especially in this case, of course, we are working uh, tightly together, the security and uh, the others, and uh, for these products, is security is also a crucial uh, value there. But uh, for all the other devices, I cannot really say that we work them to probably too small for that then. Okay, great. Oh. We're out of time. So thanks for being here, and thanks everybody for being on the panel. So thank you. Thank you. Cheers. There we are. Thanks a lot. Thank you.